the Trent skin hey my name is Alyssa Mount Pleasant I'm a faculty member at the University at Buffalo I'm also a Tuscarora descendant uh, on my father's side I am coming I'm joining this conversation from Buffalo New York in the traditional homelands of the Seneca Nation I'm very glad to be able to talk about the Sullivan campaign and particularly the period following the Sullivan campaign, which is part of my ongoing research over, um, over many years now. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which I will launch now. So if, if anyone would like to be in touch with me, I have shared my email address on this opening slide. My conversation today and our larger conversations really discussing an unprecedented invasion of uh, Haudenosaunee territory. Uh, while Professor, um, uh, <clears throat> while, um, while the previous presentation has emphasized the very short-lived um, experience of Jesuits in and around Onondaga Lake, um, other than another in invasion in the late 17th century, the Haudenosaunee territories in um, what is currently central and uh, western New York were very infrequently visited by um, Euro uh, Europeans and Euro Americans in the during the 8th, 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and so the Sullivan campaign was really a, a new expedition, a, a new um, phenomenon bringing Americans into the region um, for the very first uh, for the very first time in many cases. What I'd like to the place where I'd like to start is uh, with um, an image as well as a um, a narrative, a vignette of the, of 1779. When you travel, um, when you dri drive through back roads of New York State um, in the current day, you will often see these um, blue and gold markers uh, along the sides of the roads um, indicating sites or um, uh, or moments in the Sullivan campaign and um, Andrea Smith will talk a bit about this more in a little bit. I also have a project documenting these roadside markers and this is a, an image that I took outside of what is currently Geneva, New York. Um, and um, as we are looking at this image, I want to share with you um, uh, a narrative that I've created, a vignette, uh, about 1779 to take us back to that moment. The morning air was cool and crisp on a mid-September day in 1779. A light frost blanketed the ground at the Seneca village of Geneseo. As the sun crept over the horizon, a woman stirred on a sleeping berth in a crowded longhouse. Careful not to disturb those beside her, she slid out of bed. Within moments, she located her calico shift and skirt, smoothed her hair, and slipped into a pair of well-worn moccasins. Dressed for the day, she tiptoed carefully past the smoldering embers on the central hearth and made her way out of the building, stepping into the early morning sun. A rumble in her stomach reminded the woman it was time to start the morning meal. Walking toward the cooking lean-to, her feet crunched on the frosty ground. At the, at the cooking pit, she found a few red embers from the previous night's fire, raked them together, and set about rebuilding it. Luckily, the sky had been clear the night before, and the dry wood soon crackled. She placed a few large logs on the fire and stood up, dusting off her hands. A chipmunk scampered past the garbage heap near the clearing's edge. Moments later, her daughter peeked out from the vestibule, blinking as her eyes adjusted to the morning sun. The woman spoke softly and her daughter rushed over. It was the girl's job to fetch water, so she grabbed two wooden buckets and headed off along the path toward the river. The woman watched her daughter go, then turned to a basket of parched corn among the supplies in the lean-to. She set the basket next to a substantial hollowed out stump that served as a mortar, quickly brushed a few stray leaves out of the bowl and dumped in several 
uh, scoops of kernels. The long carved maple branch she used as a pestle felt familiar in her hands, though it was not her own. All of her cooking tools were far away, left behind when her family fled their home in Chicago the previous month. As the woman worked the corn into a rough meal, she wondered how long they would spend at Geneseo. The village was impressive, with over a hundred long houses and extraordinary agricultural fields. It was located on a beautiful uh, flat above the river, but it wasn't home. During the late summer of 1779, Haudenosaunee people fled their homes in the Finger Lakes region of today's New York State. That miserable season, American forces led by General John Sullivan invaded the Haudenosaunee homelands, laying waste to over 40 towns and villages, destroying thousands of acres of agricultural fields and felling, and felling orchards throughout the region. Four brigades of army regulars and militia members, numbering nearly 4,000 soldiers, spent weeks trekking up the Susquehanna River through the rolling terrain of the Cayuga and Seneca nations, wreaking havoc as they went. Simultaneous expeditions led by Colonel Daniel Broadhead and General James Sullivan followed other routes through the region, cutting a broad swath of destruction. As the large army slowly made its way towards major settlements, scouts alerted residents of their impending danger. Um, many people uh, whose, path, whose villages lay in the path of destruction were warned in advance of the attacks and were able to flee. Um, overmatched, right? they fled Amer as advancing American troops reached their homes, abandoning their dwellings, their food stores, and their crops that were on the verge of, uh, of harvest. Following paths that, along lake shores and over ridges, women and, ch and children uh, and those elders who were able to travel made their way west. They stopped over in towns uh, that had not yet experienced the wrath of the Continental Army soldiers and American militia members. As American forces approached the Genesee River and the extraordinary agricultural communities at places like Geneseo, yet again, people gathered what they could carry and fled further west. Nearly 20 years later, the Seneca leader farmer's brother would compare this period with a whirlwind that visited massive destruction. In, uh, in, in his, as his words were translated, this whirlwind tore up the trees and tossed to and fro the leaves so that no one knows from whence they came or where they would fall. Today, I wanna to talk a little bit about what happened after that whirlwind subsided. Um, one of the things that I argue and I think is really important to underline is that Haudenosaunee people did reestablish themselves following the events of the Sullivan campaign. As uh, Professor Arnold has indicated, that meant subsisting on, on locusts, right, which provided critical food. And I'll talk about some other strategies as well further west. Yeah. Additionally, I'm going to talk a bit about Buffalo Creek which was a new cosmopolitan community that was formed in the midst of this war, uh, where people drew on sophisticated traditions and practices uh, as they built new homes and resumed familiar subsistence patterns. Um, I wanna talk about the contours of this community as it took shape in the 1780s. And I also wanna talk a bit about the motivations for selecting Buffalo Creek as a site for the largest commun Haudenosaunee community south of the Great Lakes. Um, but before I move on to that discussion um, about what happened after the whirlwind, I need to provide some more details about the events immediately following the Sullivan campaign. Um, as we've discussed, um, houses, villages, agricultural fields were all destroyed and many, many people fled, uh, fled west. Um, they found their way to Fort Niagara where they hoped that their British allies would be able to provide some sort of refuge um, at, this, uh, at this military installation located um, along Lake, Ni uh, Lake Ontario near the mouth of the Niagara River. Unfortunately, British officials were not prepared to receive them. The fort was already harboring hundreds of loyalist ref refugees 
who had fled um, colonial settlements in the Mohawk Valley and other places. And tents, and as a result, tents and provisions were in short supply. Native people were forced to construct makeshift camps along the fort's perimeter. And as the brutally cold winter progressed, Lake Ontario froze and any hope of resupply of additional provisions uh, quickly evaporated. The historian Colin Calloway has explained that British troops, loyalists, and native peoples experienced tremendous suffering during the winter of 1779 to 1780, which was one of the coldest winters on record. Um, for those of, of this, of the picture that I have um, here on this slide sh was taken in the winter of 2014, which was, um, a, which has been referred to as a polar vortex winter. And when I try to explain and uh, help people imagine the conditions um, in the winter of 1779, I think we can, you know, we can perhaps refer to experiences that we had um, more relatively recently during that polar vortex winter. In 1779, the snow fell so deeply that it was impossible for animals to make their way through and they died in their tracks. Um, and, um, and people uh, at, at Fort Niagara and in other places where they found refuge died of exposure. They died of starvation. They died of diseases that um, that run rampant when there are poor sanitary conditions. And so when the weather started to warm up, when the ice started to thaw, um, Haudenosaunee people were desperate to relocate and, um, and many um, survivors of the Sullivan campaign who were encamped around Fort Niagara um, started to move away from that site. And they found their way to a place that we now know as Buffalo Creek. And Buffalo Creek is a place that was known in stories and traditions of Haudenosaunee people um, and also um, people who had been adopted into Haudenosaunee communities uh, during, the 17th, uh, during the 17th century. Um, stories about Buffalo Creek discuss it as a place where people could find good health and um, well-being. And um, so uh, in the early spring of 1780, people uh, started to move away. Now, this image on the um, right hand side of the screen is an image of Buffalo Creek that I took in the summer of, of 2014. Um, Buffalo Creek is located along the southern shore of Lake Erie, and the creek and its tributaries are well situated um, near the edge of what is today's Buffalo, city of Buffalo, New York. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the area was heavily wooded with deciduous forests of ash trees, bass trees, beech, chestnut, hickory, hemlock, maple, and oak trees, along with occasional stands of pine trees. And this dense forest was home to species, uh, numerous species of birds and animals. The waterways supported many, many species of fish. Um, refugees from the Sullivan campaign drew on these abundant resources as they established a new cosmopolitan community along the creek and its tributaries. Uh, beginning in spring 1780, people built new homes and cleared and cultivated fields along Buffalo Creek, where they resumed familiar social, political, and economic practices. They built villages uh, along this waterway, and by 1781, over 1,400 people called Buffalo Creek their home. This Buffalo Creek quickly became the largest Haudenosaunee community south of the Great Lakes, and it was a site where prominent leaders settled. It also served as a new political center. Residents of this community relied on Haudenosaunee traditions, including cultural uh, sub, uh, subsistence patterns, diplomatic protocols, and social and political practices that, were embed that are embedded in foundational traditions, such as the Great Law of Peace. Um, 
this is um, some of the details about uh, life at Buffalo Creek are embedded in oral traditions. Other details about life at Buff Buffalo Creek can be found in um, records created by colonial actors. And so this is a um, uh, this is a glimpse of the de demography at Buffalo Creek in the spring of 1781, and it comes from uh, British records uh, in the papers of Sir Frederick Haldeman. Um, British Indian, British in uh, Indian Department officials um, as uh, visited Buffalo Creek um, many times traveling over from Fort Niagara and also Haudenosaunee people traveled to Fort Niagara from, from Buffalo Creek and other, uh, and other Haudenosaunee settlements uh, throughout Western, uh, throughout the Western part of their territory. Um, this, these records can help us to understand some of the contours of life at Buffalo Creek in the immediate aftermath of the Sullivan campaign. And um, during a visit in the in June of 1780, so very shortly after the initial move to Buffalo Creek, a British official named Colonel G Guy Johnson reported that there were over 400 people who had settled in the area, and he he noted that more would more people would have moved along with them if he had been able to provide enough um, seed corn and also enough hose for women to cultivate um, corn and begin their resume their agricultural practices at Buffalo Creek. Additionally, um, during this period in the early 1780s, there was a woman named Rebecca, a young woman named Rebecca Gilbert, who was taken in um, to Sangaragata or Old Smoke's extended family um, during raids that followed the Sullivan campaign. And she developed a captivity narrative that um, recorded some of her experiences while living at Buffalo Creek in the early 1780s. She was part of um, planting groups with, um, with other women uh, during that time. And she traveled to sugar bushes and pigeon nesting sites. She gathered hickory nuts and worked alongside other women planting. And they also traveled to Fort Niagara and Fort Erie to exchange furs for supplies and provisions during this time. And her captivity narrative helps us to understand that Haudenosaunee people immediately resumed familiar subsistence practices, cultivating the sustainers, corn, beans, and squash, and following their, the seasonal round of hunting, fishing, gathering, and planting. Uh, we also can understand from, from this narrative that Haudenosaunee people were incorporating the British Indian Department resources right, into their seasonal round right, of um, subsistence strategies. Right? So, and alongside her adoptive family, Rebecca Gilbert sought support from the British outpost in the spring right, at a time when um, people were waiting for their crops. Uh, to mature. These Indian Department statistics that are uh, that are pictured here and other statistics that are found in the documentary record also help us to understand the steady development of new communities and Native people's seasonal reliance on their British allies. Um, according to census material in the Haldeman papers, uh, other other materials. From the spring of 1780 to the fall of that year, the number of Native people residing in settlements that they were rebuilding, which includes Buffalo Creek and other villages, increased to, to nearly 2,500 people. And that population continued to grow, right, throughout the late fall and into, into the winter. Um, in the early spring of 1781, uh, when game was scarce and supplies were depleted, more people turned to the British outpost, right? But again, as soon as the, um, the sap started to run, the ice started to break up and people could move back into their villages, um, that's what they did. Um, by um, mid-May of 1781, as, this, um, as the statistics here show, nearly 1,500 people were living at Buffalo Creek alone. Uh, and, um, and the refugee population at, um, at Fort Niagara 
had reduced to just 25% of what it was by the end of that summer. Now, why do I underline this? Um, one of the things, one of the stories that um, scholars, that historians of um, early America and of, Hod of Haudenosaunee or Iroquois history have argued um, for many years is that Haudenosaunee people um, experienced dependency following the Sullivan campaign. And this, as this snapshot and other stories that we can tell um, about this period show, um, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, Haudenosaunee people were moving as quickly as they could to reestablish their communities and to continue to pursue their own goals in um, defending their communities, defending their territories, and um, maintaining uh, their sovereignty during this period of tremendous upheaval in the eastern part of North America. And um, in the years in the years that followed at Buffalo Creek, uh, people continued uh, <clears throat> to um, at this multinational community, this cosmopolitan community, continued to pursue um, war, diplomacy, and peace. Can remained active um, in raiding and um, and military exploits despite the efforts of the um, Continental Army to destroy the um, the home front, uh, the Haudenosaunee home front. This is an image, uh, well there's two images here. One image on the on the right is of um, a, a gentleman that in English is referred to as Captain Cold, who was uh, a leader within the, an Onondaga leader within the Confederacy. And then on the left hand side is a an artist's representation of a council that was held at Buffalo Creek around 1793. Um, Haudenosaunee people convened numerous meetings at Buffalo Creek um, in, in their efforts to cultivate dip and maintain diplomatic relationships with um, Native and non-Native people whose territories um, uh, were adjacent or adjacent to their own. And um, between 1780, uh, 1784 and 1794, Haudenosaunee people were, were incredibly active at Buffalo Creek, at Philadelphia, at Albany, and other places uh, negotiating with Americans to establish a, a meaningful peace following the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. And um, this involved um, these efforts concluded in 1794 at um, Canandaigua, uh, which is a town uh, on, um, on Seneca Lake. Uh, these efforts invoke the Treaty of Canandaigua, which remains in place to this day, established peace and friendship with the Haudenosaunee, or Six Nations, and the United States. It reiterated nation-to-nation -nation relationships between the Six Nations and uh, the United States, and it guaranteed the territory, uh, the territorial integrity of the um, of the of the Six Nations, and particular particularly the the Seneca Nation. It was signed at Canandaigua in 1794. Over 1,600 people from um, Haudenosaunee communities travel to Canandaigua to participate in this, um, in this lengthy negotiation, and, which was the result of many, many years of diplomatic uh, work on the part of Haudenosaunee people who, were, who undertook the really challenging process of um, helping Americans to understand the practices and protocols of Haudenosaunee diplomacy. Um, was ratified by the Senate in 1795, and as I've mentioned, it is a um, uh, it, it is a treaty that remains in place today. Next month, next month on November 11th, there will be a commemoration at Canandaigua, um, as there is every year of this incredibly important agreement. Um, for Haudenosaunee people and for, for Seneca people in particular, this, um, 
the guarantees of the Treaty of Canandaigua in terms of territorial integrity right, were very quickly challenged. And within three years, um, Americans gathered um, with, some, with some Haudenosaunee people at, um, at, at Big Tree. Um, along the Genesee River to enact a treaty um, in the fall of 1797. This is a treaty that um, resulted in the loss of uh, vast amounts of territory west of the Genesee River. And it was a treaty that reflected um, the interests of a man named Robert Morris, who was a major, um, who was a critical uh, financier of the American side of, of the revolution. He was in dire financial straits and at that time and really desperate to um, create conditions where his, um, his claims to um, preemption of um, Haudenosaunee territories um, in the western part of what is currently New York State would allow him to recoup some of his uh, and, and restore his financial condition. Um, this is in the center. There, uh, on the left hand side of this slide, there is a um, statue of Robert Morris in Philadelphia near Independence Hall, marking his prominence in early American history. And uh, in the center is another roadside marker um, that can be found on the campus of SUNY Geneseo. And finally, there's a map indicating um, reservation territories that were um, reserved during the 1797 Treaty of, um, uh, of Big Tree. Um, circling back to Buffalo Creek, Buffalo Creek was one of the reservation territories that was created um, during the Treaty of, uh, through the Treaty of um, Big Tree. And this is a much later map of Buffalo Creek uh, of Buffalo Creek. It dates to about 1845. It marks off the reservation as it as land speculators were preparing to sell the territory. I don't have time to get into it right now, but there were two um, treaties in 1838 and 1842 that resulted in the loss of the Buffalo Creek Reservation. Um, following the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825, Buffalo Creek um, was um, highly sought after as a location for the city of the, the city of Buffalo hoped to be able to expand into. And so there was a fraudulent treaty in 1848 and a, a compromise treaty in 1842. Um, together, those two treaties resulted in the loss of Buffalo Creek. The 1842 treaty did allow um, for Seneca people to retain um, other, their other reservation territories. The last thing that I want to talk about um, at Buffalo Creek is the ways in which Haudenosaunee people during the 19th century um, worked uh, to maintain their territory while selectively engaging with colonists. Um, and by colonists here, I mean Americans. Right? I mean, US, US citizens who were moving into the region and sending missionaries uh, into to Buff to, to Buffalo Creek and reservations um, throughout, uh, all along the Eastern seaboard. Uh, at Buffalo Creek, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time um, studying is the ways in which Native, uh, Native people spent over a decade um, debating amongst themselves about the appropriate place for formal schooling uh, in their communities. And that eventually led to a decision within the community to allow some missionaries to establish a school where they would teach um, reading, writing, and uh, arithmetic. Um, Haudenosaunee people at Buffalo Creek, which included Senecas, Cayugas, Onondagas, and members of other communities who made their homes there, um, were highly suspicious of the work of missionaries. And at the same time, as more and more Americans moved into um, and established adjacent communities, they recognized that um, these are skill sets that they needed to have and they negotiated as carefully as they possibly could with missionaries um, about the establishment of schools in their, um, in their regions. 
in their in their reservation community. Uh, this is a much bigger topic um, that um, that we all would be happy to talk that I would be happy to talk about further. Um, but it is it is one I argue that in my larger work that this is one of the strategies um, that Haudenosaunee people use alongside various other diplomatic strategies um, to work to maintain Buffalo Creek as a Haudenosaunee place in the midst of um, expanding U.S. settler colonialism. I'll stop there. Thank you.